Right. Okay, you're turning to me. Am yes, I, we're, tu- I, we're turning to you, Connor. Have I got a thing? All right. Um, a uh, full, full disclosure, yeah. I have not prepared at all for this because I just got back off the train about half an hour ago. So oh, you're going to do brilliantly. This will be wonderful. <laughs> you're you're, you're going to do brilliantly. So you, because we, we kind of have a theme, you know, him and I. We, he, he does thinking um, and, and I do money. Right. Or shooting. Um, um, and, and, and you do, and you sort of, you cover the cultural decline for us. Yes. yes. So, so I've got a weird sort of niche over at the Lotus Eaters because when I joined about a year ago, I didn't actually interview for the job, which was mm. quite fun because I just came on, I was intended to do a guest podcast and then Carl just went, oh, do you want a cup of tea? And we walked into the kitchen and he just turned around to me and went, oh, when can you start? So I've, I've sort of lodged myself in with weird little passion projects that I find Kind of interesting, and ever since the start of this year, well, there's there's, there's two reasons I've sort of fallen into this niche of uh, the cultural decline, trying to bring a, a ceasefire between the, the war of the sexes, and because you do do a lot of premium content, but you're just like minister without portfolio. It doesn't... Yeah, I I, I I worked out how many videos I do, and ever since starting, I've averaged one every other day. Um, so I'm a bit of a workaholic, it turns out. But but one of so there were two reasons I did this, and, and number one is because I, before I worked in that worked here and a little bit in media as well. Yeah. I was in the sort of think tank politic, politics sphere and I was kind of sick of the managerial mindset that had infected every single NGO and parliament and the like yes. that had made them deaf to whether or not we could question the paradigm and the trajectory of travel and more so we were just negotiating the speed and treating people like beads on an abacus, like sliding them along and just giving them the right amount of conditions and then they'll just shut up and take whatever the elite think. Livestock management is, is all that governments do these days. Yeah, yeah. spot on. Yeah, it, it, it's, the, it's the golden arches theory applied to literally everyone it, despite what's, that. What's being, the golden arches theory? You know the idea that if uh, two nations have a McDonald's and never go to war? So it's the idea that if we just give them enough bread and circuses and enough material prosperity, then cultural issues don't matter. That's why Michael Gove dismisses everything as as an irrelevant culture war. All we've got to do is just negotiate exactly how we're going to... Mind you, that Golden Arches thing would have broken with Ukraine and Russia. That's exactly what I'm saying. So even though the theory is debunked, um, they still treat everyone like economic integers on a spreadsheet that they can just actually program without any sort of set like sentimental concerns or cultural and parochial... um, preferences and things like that. The, the, so the Westminster Bible just don't do that. And, and when I was, so I was developing a paper when I was doing environmental policy and I was kind of asked to write to spec and I really kicked up a fuss about that and I attempted to circumvent a lot of what the government were already doing in the paper. And they listened to some of it. So they ended up financing some more nuclear power stations, but they ignored me when I was saying, well, you do realize that doubling down on renewables is going to put us at a disadvantage from importing all the oil and gas stuff. And then if a conflict kicked off, for example, with Russia, um, well, that's going to leave us up shit creek, isn't it? And then, well, about six six to eight months later, that happened. Um, so I was kind of annoyed by okay, the fact so that you, no one was you listening. Were, you were trying to basically give sound practical advice but that didn't align with the narrative. Yes. And the government was like, no, just give us the narrative. Yes. Yes. And, and, and the narrative yes. at, at speed at which makes it feasible to get there and we can sell it to the plebs rather than, well, is this the, is this the destination we actually want so, to So effe- effectively, they were asking you to do policy-based evidence finding. Yes. Yeah, exactly. You know, like the sage modeling that they said, we're going to model for the outcomes we've already predicted. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. That, that was the entire policy sphere. And I wasn't like that. I was more interested in the okay. moral texture of where were, we're going. You were a policy wonk. Yes, but you got disillusioned by the fact that it was just kind of fantasy. Stuff. Yeah, I, I hated the permanently encrusted NGO bureaucracy where people just exist to spin wheels and manufacture consent for their own NGO existing rather than solve a problem. So I, I bounced out, hated it, um, and then then came and joined here. But but part of the reason why that feeds into what I'm doing is because I'm trying to rebuild a kind of paradigm or heuristic for living that is outside that managerial bean counting idea. And this is something that I, I said about earlier. The Zoomers, they they think about all relationships as transactional. And yep. so all we do is think about each other as integers. And you can't really have a eudaimonic, wholesome life if you just think about how much value can I extract from the other person. Um, we, we had this conversation about Crowder and the Daily Wire contract. Yes. Where, whereas Crowder, despite his possible personal failing sins, it, he was complaining, we were friends, you don't come to me with terms like this that presume that you can screw me over unless I kick up a fight. And Daily Wire was just saying, it's just business. And too many people now are thinking it's just business in their own personal relationships um, because we've been trained to deracinate ourselves from local communities, to go out to the city, to live, to go to university, to party it up and think that our own actions don't have consequences. 
and actually it, it, it comes down to the sort of sexual revolution idea of relationships of where um yeah if you if you have some kind of hookup relationship then all of the inevitable consequences that existed for thousands of years before that can have a technological intervention that can take away said consequences. So we, we see um, bursts through uh, uh, examples of this sort of burst into the culture all the time. I mean, one, one of the recent ones was the whole thing about the body count issue. Yes. I mean, it's a, it's a perfect example of that. Purely materialistic, purely transactional. And then all of a sudden, it, 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 it clashes with the underlying um, instincts of the other part of that, of that equation. Yeah, well, and this is and this is why I don't like the way it's currently being talked about because the opposition to the body count argument is you're depreciating your sexual market value, and that's not how you actually think about someone. What it what it yeah. does is it creates precarious grounds on which to trust someone because you don't you can't guarantee that if they view themselves in such a depreciated way that they won't see the sacredness of your relationship. Yes, when you're in it with them, even if even if they claim to do so because they haven't got the history of doing that. It's not about adding up your relative qualities on the spreadsheet and then rationalistically deciding to come together because you can't trade up and there's no better offer. It's about how people feel about the other person. And it feels like a violation of trust before you even met them. This is the Logan Paul situation that's going on right now. But Which is it, funny. Yeah, it's, but it, it, but it's funny, but it's also kind of tragic because yes. It's, yes, not, it is. it's not necessarily his fault that his fiance was a whore. But... Yeah. He should have more respect for himself and be able to select a woman that shouldn't be that. But he doesn't value himself in such a way that he thinks he could command more. He yeah, so there's a bit of loyalty. beta energy going on there. Yeah, absolutely. He's, he's got a fat guy's mind. This, this is something Patrice O'Neill said, right? Is you can be a fat guy that gets in shape, but you'll still appro uh, approach a woman with the idea that you don't deserve her, and she can like feel that energy re resonating off of you, and she'll be put off by it. Yes, and so like thinking of thinking of how we relate to each other in a very transactional way has been something I've been trying to reform, and and part of the reason of that as well is that I'm not immune from this. But yeah. all all Zoomers have had something taken from them. This is something that C.S. Lewis wrote about in the opening of Abolition of Man. We've been miseducated to believe that everything we feel about the world is not derived from something eternal and true from the world that we interpret it, that we have a shared culture, but it's just an artificial projection that can be substituted out for another projection. So for example, um, actually, if you're sleeping around, then society is slaming you, shaming you for being a slut and your conscience is that standard that you've internalized and if you just get rid of the standard, then you'll be really empowered and you'll have absolutely you no know, consequences. And no, there is actually something eternal and true there that governs human interactions, yeah. that you're gaslighting an entire generation into turning their blinkers off. And then they're going to run up against those adverse consequences down the road. And then you're going to get an entire generation of either men that can't get women that are loyal or fem cells who 40 years after 40 have no one to care for them. And they're going to be like a resentful revolutionary constituency. So I can see this massive problem the, heading the, down the road. The oversupply my, of spinster issue that we've got coming down the track at us. Absolutely. Because at the moment we're dealing with the, in, the incel problem. Yeah. Um, but they're actually behaving themselves reasonably well. Yes. Um, but I, I kind of suspect that the 40 and 50 year old spinsters are not going to be happy once they realize what they've locked themselves into. Well, also the incels can't vote. They don't have the power to compel the state to vote them more money. Whereas the 40 and 50 year old women do. They can just henpeck you into making all productive men, particularly other women's husbands who have made the right choices, redistribute all of their income to subsidize their bad lifestyles. And that's already happening at scale. Imagine how much worse it's going to get. And, and the reason I say I have a personal stake in this is because like towards the start of the year, you know, I was one of the guys that thought I had it all worked out, had a personal relationship breakdown, had to reassess things, and plunging back into the kind of sphere that lots of other men are experiencing. And I'm probably slightly better positioned than some of the viewers. Um, but to try and grapple with this myself means that I'm within the paradigm that, that lots of other people are also operating in. And so I'm trying to articulate it so we can all, because yep. I, I feel like I'm compelled to try and speak into being a world that is better than the current one that I can raise my so, I mean, there, there always is something about being a young man, which is, which is finding your place and all that kind of yes. thing. I mean, that's, I mean, take, take Taxi Driver, which, which is a film about essentially that. I mean, I, 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 suppose, I suppose it goes off in other directions as well. Yeah, slightly, yes. yeah. But, but it, is, it is essentially, the, the, the foundation is, is a young man trying to find his place and kind of stuff. So, so it, is, it is an old and eternal story that, that every generation goes through but yeah it does feel like this is why some Zoomers people are, are extra screwed it's why they're resonating with Ken right now right yes so they 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 want patriarchy but it's performative like they're literally riding invisible horses but the only way out is through so we kind of have to LARP for a little bit and rediscover the things that we've been cut off from in order to replant our roots and yes. the thing is and I spoke to loads of students yesterday when Carl went and Carl and I went and did an event 
they were asking for answers, but they were also saying, what, are you just predicting, saying that we should like grow a garden and do a manual job and get a girlfriend and go to church? Like, is there not more than that? Is it, and it's like, there's not really much you can do right now because the political system has its ears closed. I'm not saying don't organize because you have to, but don't expect that overnight you can change the system that hates you. Instead, all you can do is take root and it might feel a bit performative, but it's only because you're trying to re-articulate something rationally that two generations prior didn't even need to be examined, and that's why they were much happier. So we're a sort of limbo lost generation. We need to re-anchor ourselves, reforge that great chain. Yeah, because I mean, there, there was a progression that was on offer for the for the oldest millennials, the Gen Xers and the Boomers, which is um, essentially sort of play the game, get a home, get a family, and sort of have a place in a community and all that kind of stuff. But it's I mean, I suppose you can be a Zoomer and have a house, but it's... It, it, when? It, well, it takes a hell of a doing. It takes either your grandparents having to die off, which means that your own children won't have that close connectivity that I, for example, really benefited from. Uh, or it means being a passport bro and going elsewhere and accepting a lot well, of... Uh, yeah, I mean, we got to the point where... I mean, this is the whole thing with women's liberation. So women, women were liberated from having to stay at home. So you know, excellent, you can go out and you can get a job now if you want to. Well, so, actually, we, we spoke about that in a two-part series. Yeah, so right. So, so yeah, so, so you, women can now go out and get a job if they want to. Except after a few decades, um, th actually that choice goes. Yeah, it becomes mandatory. You, you both need to work. You both have to. So it's not a choice anymore. It's So you, you used to have the choice for a short, so you had this window of liberation, which was choose between home and work. And now it's just you choose work. And, 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 and then for a while, for the millennials, you could then have a period where, okay, you could both work until you bought a house and then you've got it and then you're just servicing the debt, right? And then the woman can go and work. And I just wonder for the millennials, is it going to be that, no, actually you can either have a house and remain childless or... Yeah, you know, you, you have to pick one or the other. But there's there's two parts to that. And then for Gen Alpha, it would be like, yeah, you need to be in a polygamous bloody relationship in order to have a house. Yeah, you you, you need like a communal longhouse, for example. Yes. So there's there's two parts to that. So the the first part of this was Evil Oranges of Feminism, Part One, where I went through Simone de Beauvoir's Second Sex, 800 pages of the worst tripe I've ever read. But the problem is that she was a um, groomer, resentful spinster who then slept with John Paul Sartre and she wanted the entire world to become a Marxist brotherhood by psychologically and biologically reconditioning women to be on par with men to the point of where the last line of her book was brotherhood. Or she wanted the human race to discontinue because she compared herself to Tiamat, you know, the great dragon of chaos. I always assume Sartre was gay. Well, maybe I was thinking of Foucault. Yeah, you're, you're thinking of Foucault, yeah. Um, oh, so that was boys. The yeah. problem, yeah, exactly. Nonce. The problem is that all of those insane suppositions have now become culturally ubiquitous. But yes. my, the, the my body, my choice narrative, the baby is a parasite narrative, the women need to work narrative, they all come from second sex. And they were yes. retroactively legitimated by technological development. And that's something we discussed in the part two that came from. Because I think, I think most women are at the point where they understand now that the choice has been taken away from them. But you still, you, even now, you still meet women who, who perceive it in the terms of, of this. Yeah. Which is, which is the, 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 the liberation. It's not, not liberation. It's, no. It's, that's gone. It's compulsion. But but yes. this is this is why technological innovation creates a ratcheting effect upwards towards conforming to certain pressures. And so the invention of the birth control pill retroactively legitimated by was ideas, because she wrote Second Sex in the late 1940s. Birth control yep. pill came comes around late 60s, early 70s to be more widely available. Inducts women into the workforce and therefore institutionalizes lots of the original roles that women had. And what happens there is the reason you have to choose between a family or a house is because originally they were indistinguishable. And they were yes. indistinguishable because the oikos, the household, the family unit, was the primary mode of market, civic, and social participation. That was the only mode by which you were classified. You'd move from one household to another. That's why communities would start bringing people together. That's why dating is relatively new, and it's actually a burden to place on single individuals. That's why they've outsourced it to these algorithms that help us commodify each other and, and create spreadsheets. Because we understand metrics easier than navigating vague things like trust with no help. And so we actually went through this discussion of how that's a product of the industrial economy and then the sexual revolution was almost inevitable and how to reverse that through yeah. a sort of consciousness revolution of telling mutually subsisting stories rather than thinking of each other as economic actors and yeah. women walking away from the birth control pill because that is one of the worst innovations that's ever happened, uh, particularly for women as well because if what happens with the birth control pill is women, all the consequences of sex suddenly land on them. So if you sleep with a caddish guy, then yes. it is your responsibility to have that abortion Right, so the baby becomes immediately devalued as a as a as a undesirable consequence of hookups. And if women are more agreeable, then 
rather than holding off and commanding better standards of men, and believe me, the standards for men dating now are way too high, which is why we're doing a brokenomics on, on hoflation, but they're just not proportionate. Back then, they were high, but they were proportionate, right? And what happens is, if you go on a date with a man, now, consent doesn't mean you can say yes or no. Yes. It means that the default assumption is yes, because you have no consequences from it. So you have to invent new reasons why to say no. Yes, yeah, so, 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 so this, this is up. going from a culture that we used to have a very long time, which was basically sex was essentially the same thing as a proposal. I mean, if you, 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 you'd be a dragooned into marrying the girl or yes. shotgun marriage or, or, or whatever it was. To where we've arrived at now, which views babies as a sexually transmitted disease. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and and it is an, it is such an incursion on your autonomy that women, and this is something that Abigail Favale wrote out, which I did an interview with her at some point, um, where the default <clears throat> assumption of a woman's fertility because of the birth control pill is to change a working biological function to having the setting not being on but off. It's the first intervention that didn't correct something that's wrong with the body. It meant that something that was right with the body was made wrong. Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay, that's good. and so and so sterility is now the prerequisite for women to participate in the workforce on parity with men, which means that Simone de Beauvoir's vision of brotherhood yes. and antinatalism is real. It's happened. So we're living in the aftermath of that disaster. Tell so me one thing. The, the feminists won. Currently, yes. Oh dear. I have the impression that feminists are blowing out of proportion the idea of uh, the importance that it being a man with a high body count had before. And it seemed to me that they did preach the message to women that you need to be sexually liberated. And because men acted like that, women should act like that as well. Yes. Uh, what, what do the people you interview say about this? Oh, so because I, you have been doing many interviews. Yeah, so I actually had a chat with quite a few people. Um, so I had a chat with Louise Perry, specifically, who's written The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. And she comes at this from an evolutionary psychological angle. So she says very contentious things like, um, no, actually, the feminists are wrong about rape. It's not about power. It's actually a mating strategy for low-status men to take by force what they otherwise wouldn't get. And unless you understand that, then you can't create strong interventions against it. So you can't like teach men with consent workshops not to rape, because the ones that know not to rape won't rape. Instead, you can just have such harsh penalties that you'll scare some of the weaker men into not doing it. And that allows a strong male role in society because they can act as the punishers and the, and the distributors of morality. But then the next boat turns up and they haven't been on this course. Oh yeah, exactly. That's also part of the part of the problem. We just have to lower migration, yeah. of course. And and so her her case against the sexual revolution has been quite useful among young women who have feel aggrieved by this lack of a cultural fabric, and so they've been persuaded by that. And and one of her contemporaries, who I'm very grateful to have spoken to, uh, is Mary Harrington. We've since become very very good friends, and her book which is Feminism Against Progress, has actually been a real paradigm former for me. Recommend everyone read it. Slash watch mine and Carl's discussion, Evil Origins of Feminism, part two. And she goes through this industrial trajectory of how technology made feminism inevitable and how it's essentially made us unisex. So like the Dino is the ultimate unisex man because men and women are doing the exact same jobs now, but you're wearing the paraphernalia of hyperfemininity and hypermasculinity, but you have to buy it and it's ultimately non-functional. Like Dino shredded, but he doesn't do any manual work. Mrs. Dinette is on Instagram flouting her curvaceousness, but her <laughs> boob job makes it impossible to breastfeed. So she's not actually fertile. Like things like that. So now sex is opt-in and cosmetic. And is she's making TikTok videos as well. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So you're you're monetizing your sexuality, but it's ultimately sterile. So that's where the zoomers are, which sucks. Not not great. No. Yes. Um, and then, and then, yeah, I, I had a chat with like Freya India about the specific pressures that go on to women. I had a chat with Nina Power about the specific pressures that go on to men. And she isn't actually one of these feminists that have been gatekeeping the definition of masculinity, like in the press. She just asked men what they wanted. So, so, so these these are all feminists, but they're talking. To well, they're you. not really feminists. They're not right. So really. Like, you you got these different tranches of feminists. Haven't you? yeah. You've got the first wave, and then and so what? What kind of feminists are the kind of feminists that are, are willing to sit down and have a conversation? Well, with they're you? calling themselves reactionary feminists because Mary said it's a signal scramble that upsets all the right people. But feminism has become culturally synonymous with in women's interests, and she's saying, well, currently feminism is liberal, universal, and makes men and women lose their sex differences, and so we are more alike than ever. Um, this is something that Nina calls a sibling economy, of where we're like, a bit like Cain and Abel rather than Adam and Eve. So we're competing for the same vectors of competence and resources. But that means that because we're so alike, it would be a bit incestuous for us to have relationships. So no one's having relationships. So we need to be way more different, and then we can come back together and have those families again. Uh, um, 
Yeah, sorry, important question because yeah. I think that you are doing something really important. Okay, and th there are many people who say that, well, you shouldn't talk to to them because they are not on our side. Why do you think that it's important to talk to them? Um, one, private communications which cannot be leaked means they're very on our side. Um, two, as well, you are not going to get out of this without women being on board. And not just because single women are the overwhelming cohort that vote for left-wingers, but because women do not listen to men, frankly. Mainly, they do not. Unless they're men they really care about. That's the concept of headship. But we don't have those families. We don't have those fathers in the home at the moment. So... So steal a phrase from Mary, culture will be downstream what the hot girls want. And as soon as the hot girls... I was just, just going to ask you about that. Yeah, as soon as the hot girls have a reaction against the sexual revolution, like Sydney Sweeney, the most perfect woman on earth, turning around and saying, I'm a director, but at 25 I thought I'd be a mum by now and it's all worthless without it. When it starts swinging that way, that's when some more women are going to start to listen. Yeah, but here's an issue. Go on. If, if I want to see how compatible this is with what you said before about um, going to women and tr and communicating to them that I want you to be on board with this mm -hmm. if, they, if they see this as low status. What do you mean low status in how? Well, I mean, let's take flirt for instance. If you, commu if you scream to a lady that you know, I, I, I'm here to care for all your wishes and solve all your problems, mm -hmm. it's not going to work. Yeah, but that's not the way of community. That's not how it is. Okay, what, what you've got are two current camps aggrieved by the current paradigm. Yeah. But we have inaccessible languages to each other. That's why the, some of these women are talking to these women. And we've got a lot of men talking to a lot of dispossessed young men, I think, a lot of the time in the wrong way. They're saying maladapts to the current paradigm by out-competing women with so many Bugattis that you just... But, but it, isn't there a fundamental mismatch in this, in that it, it, young men notice it first because they, basically they want to get laid and they're not, and you're getting this massive uh, uh, incels, like 30% of all young men are incels now. Well, okay, so, so, so the numbers breaking down are quite interesting there because yeah. that's, on, that's on the low... So that distribution is most pronounced among 18 to 22. Though the, they yeah. age out of that a little bit, but what the actual, I think, complaint is at the heart of this, and this is also part of why some of the MGTOW guys who really don't like me um, uh, are complaining, is that, that it's not so much about sex, but intimacy. Like it's the fact that this culture has robbed us of our ability to trust one another and form nourishing relationships and have families. Because people yes. can have these hookups. Again, I've, yep, I've been yep. involved in this culture, but it's ultimately meaningless. It's just kind of sad. Yeah, but no, so, so the point I'm thinking about in terms of the mismatch is, is young men notice it first yes. because it, it impacts them at, at this sort of early age. Hmm. Whereas for the young women, they, they get messages thrown at them when they're, when they're, when they're girls and the young girls. Which is, you know, all the media and the Disney, and the, which is the, you know, the girl boss, and you do this, and actually the most rewarding thing in life is to have an office cubicle job and have a boss who hates you and all that kind yep. of stuff. And by the time it gets to the point that they notice that, oh, hang on, this this has gone seriously wrong, and I don't like this, um, they're past their sort of critical point in order to get their life together, and they're now in their sort of thirties or forties, and so so there's a natural mismatch in the experience that men and women have of the same problem, mm. which is the, the inability to trust each other and the, the, the disincentives to sort of pair bond and all the rest of it. That's how, but it, but that, it is a fundamentally different way of perceiving the same problem and talking about it. Yeah, and that's how it has been for quite some time. And that's why it's worthwhile having these conversations with to undo the cultural brainwashing that has robbed women of their fertility and their ability to trust men from the mouth of these women. And also quite a few of these women have very cutting ways of understanding the perverse incentives of culture as they have fallen yeah. on women specifically that are just inaccessible to us because I've been reliably informed that representation matters. And so if our embodied differences are very different, then we can understand them up until a point, but we also need that ambiguous complementarity. And it's worth me talking to these women because they have the same with us. Like they don't understand the experience of young men. All they can say is we need to let young men sort out themselves. So coming together, having that solidarity and allowing each other to make space for each other to fix the culture, I think that's probably the healthy way to go about it. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Connor. All right. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium contents on the site, such as the book clubs we do, this one on Doug Stokes Against Decolonization. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Getter at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.